So this video is going to be all about coastal management, particularly focusing on coastal dunes in the areas of um, Botany Bay and Cronulla. So a lot of the management strategies that we'll look at are fairly proactive ones um, or reactive ones where people have decided to try and fix some problem from the past, but also try and prevent measures from um, prevent sorry damage from the future with measures that we can put into place now. One thing that I think needs to be made clear from the start is that any type of interaction with a coastal dune or any other environment is considered management. So we can even think about people littering, that's management of the coastal dune. It's a poor version of management and not in a positive way, but any interaction is still considered management. The main ones that we're gonna focus on are fencing, groins, signage and education, and seawalls. So I just wanted to talk you through a couple of the management strategies that you might see at beaches like Cronulla. You've got obviously signage, education is an important um, way to make sure the public are doing the right thing. But some of the other things that you'll be able to see on this particular sign is that it talks about um, a section 14 of the Companion Animals Act, which does mean that you can um, um, bring species in like a dog that um, you know if you're a blind person that's a companion animal but if it's not a companion animal then that means that it's restricted and there's a penalty for that so it's it's enforcing both education reminding people of what to do what not to do but it's also telling people um, about legislation another management strategy you know you want to scare the pants off people um, as i walk into the high area you'll also see a couple of other examples and i'll point these out um, later on but fencing fencing is a widely used practice at beaches near urban areas so fencing in this case might not look much to you we've got here's an example this is what we call a pole and wire fence and again you'll see these once we go onto the proper dunes but you've got wooden poles about a meter and a half high um, joined together usually with a top rail that's about two to three meters long and that sort of gives it that structure and stability and that's a pretty good sign to people and cars as well to keep off the the fragile areas of the dune in amongst those poles though you've got thick wire now i'll try and get a bit closer so you can so you can see it a bit better that thick wire is probably about half a centimeter thick maybe a couple of middle two or three millimeters thick at least and it's probably spaced out about 30 centimeters 30 centimeter spacing now you, obviously that's not going to keep many people out kids can wander through but the main purpose of the wire is to act as a barrier but it also allows some of the natural processes to still occur and some of the natural processes that i mean are the accretion cycle that's the movement of sand on and off the beach so wind could blow sand through these large gaps great it could also mean that small animals and I don't know if you can hear in the background, but there's a lot of little tweeting birds, like willy wagtails and terns. They'll nest in these vegetated areas of the dune, so that allows them to pop in and out. Um, and the other thing is, and you can see it here, is that vegetation can still grow um, across the, the, the fenced in sites. So it sounds a bit weird, but vegetation does move. And once I go onto the dunes, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. So the, the vegetation is actually, as it grows, it moves along the dune system. So a groin is essentially a low wall, which will um, trap sand from moving along the beach, basically interrupting longshore drift and ensuring that sand does stay on the, the um, uh, beach area. I made a short clip at Botany um, I apologise for any of the sound and um, the wobbling of the camera. All right, here's one of the management strategies that they use um, down here at Botany. And you might be able to see this a couple of times if I look a bit further north in the background. But essentially, this is what we would call a groin. It's a low rock wall. Sometimes it's just made out of cement. In this case, it's made out of large rocks. And those rocks um, have a very important function. What they're aiming to do is usually just to stop the flow of sand through longshore drift. So if we know that sand starts at the southern end of a beach and will move northwards, what they're aiming to do a lot of the time is to prevent a lot of that northward movement of sand. You might wonder why. What's the purpose of 
blocking the flow of natural flow of sand. Well, if we want to maintain sand um, in an ecosystem like this, we would put these rock walls in place and they effectively create a physical barrier to stop that flow of sand. And that means that on this particular part of the beach, there will always be sand because of that rock wall. You see it in a lot of places like um, England, they use it um, a lot. Um, and they actually have used these as well in far north New South Wales. The most famous example probably for us is they use a, a, a type of groin, but it's more of a, a longer um, training wall, they call it. And the purpose of that is to um, hold the Tweed River um, open because it was um, filling up the sand because of longshore drift. And the, the council around there said, well, we, we would prefer that um, the river stays open so boats can move in and out of the Tweed River. But um, by building this uh, training wall, this large groin in effect, they stopped the flow of the, the sand. And the in, unintended consequence of that was that the, the beaches further north on the Gold Coast um, stopped receiving sand. So they had to eventually come up with a new management system to re-promote the uh, flow of sand. Try not to bore you too much with this one, but signage is a really great way to inform the public about what they can and can't do on a beach. So they might be used to enforce regulation, let people know about fines if they do the wrong thing. The other great thing is they also inform the public about some of the different actions, um, such as rehabilitation or replanting that are going on, to try and restore the dunes to their natural processes and their natural functioning. Sea walls are used all around the world to help protect the coastline, in particular the coastline where there's human activity. So you'll often see um, where there is a seawall, there'll often be a port, um, an area for um, boats to moor, like a marina, or it might be where there's human development, such as housing on the coastline. And the main aim of it is to re-establish the coastline and prevent further erosion, because they're often built in response to erosion, as well as protection of um, sea craft. So the one that I've got an example for from Cronulla is the CB wall. The CB wall was established because of some large storm surges which eroded away the natural landscape when um, there was housing above. So the diagram showing the plan will show you that it actually has a um, quite a large angle to it, the slope of the, the wall. Um, is meant to dissipate the energy from the wave along with its hexagonal blocks which have holes in them. Um, the, the aim is that as the wave moves up that um, it will lose energy and it will be broken up. At the very top of the wall is a lip and that concave lip will deflect the wave back on itself um, reducing the amount of damage that it can occur. Um, this along with groins do interrupt parts of the natural flow of sand so in conjunction with this They'll often um, dump sand off on an offshore bar, ready to replenish the beach as well. In other areas of the world, they use different types of sea walls. Um, Spain's a pretty good example because they've uh, invented something called the cubipod. And the cubipod um, works a little bit better than some traditional methods of um, using cement blocks to build sea walls. And that's because it fits together and anchors itself um, better but also provides little nooks and crannies for sea creatures to call home. So it actually produces habitat, even though it's an artificial coastline. Living seawalls are also another way that we're trying to um, give back to natural processes. So you will see that some examples that are here are around Sydney, another place in the world where um, artificial coastlines, which have a very vertical um, look to them, are now being um, applied with these um, tiles which have a lot of nooks and crannies and again we're just returning some texture back to those walls so that their habitat can be re-established. <laughs>